Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Shi Jun Wang. Uh, today we're going to continue working on the Chopin fourth ballad. So last time we stopped at measure number 58. Um, and as I mentioned before, with that relation to the story about the three brothers, um, because there's the, the theme appeared three times and each time with exactly the same melody, but different atmosphere, different mood, and, and, and also pretty identical harmonic pro uh, progressions underneath. So measure 58 is exactly where uh, the second time the theme comes back. Um, and if we compare this with the first time when the, the theme appears, First of all, the texture is much thicker. Yeah, we have a middle voice, which pretty much has this 16th notes on every single beat. Yeah, when the middle voice stops, then the left hand will continue. Uh, so so, so this kind of uh, uh, consistent eight, uh, 16th note really makes the music moving forward with more, much more mo momentum. Yeah, the direction compared to the first time, it really is much more, it's tremendous. Um, the other thing um, my students often overlook is the left hand. Um, the first time it was still same chords, but going down from the top. So it's almost like the uh, mood of a sigh. But here it's going up. So it's the same harmony. Yeah? Even with the same pedal point, um, but totally different feeling. I guess um, what shows this more is the timing. So instead of instead of this kind of almost steel feeling, but constantly pushing forward, pushing forward. And, and one very interesting fact, I don't think I've heard anybody uh, talking about, um, is this middle voice, this 16th note, if I just play this part um, without any background knowledge of, you know, it's the middle voice of this second theme in the second time the theme appears in Force Ballad, um, da, 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 it's Bach. It's it's something you can easily locate in the Bach prelude in, in the Wild Temple Clavier. Um, and what happens if we really treat this like Bach? We would add this two notes. We'll play it like that. So Chopin didn't didn't uh, imitate that. Until we see in measure 61. So he's totally aware of that. Yeah, he just didn't want this. He didn't want this to interrupt this ongoing right hand uh, melody. But once the melody had a little pause or finished the first uh, phrase. Because this tonal slur has another function, which is to show urgency. So I, this is something we have to. So 
one of the biggest challenge here is uh, there's only forte and the forte is for the right hand top voice so all of these thick chords and low chords yeah it's one two three almost like three octaves wide we can only play this forte uh, metal forte at most yeah if we want to yeah, then we can totally we have to uh, we cannot hear the top voice so voicing here we need to be extra extra careful um, until measure 68 it gets better because now uh, right hand has octaves right? the melody really now it's just the the, uh, the chords <laughs> To remember these cannot overpower yeah when it's that low if you play it like you want we can't hear the right hand um so after this yeah this is the only place so far that has forte semo and So here we have a ritanuto marked on measure 70, um, but we don't know, there's no marking of tempo uh, in measure 71, but what we know is 72 Chopin put in tempo, uh, meaning go back to tempo. And that's actually a evidence of um, what we can, we can know, because 71 clearly is not in tempo. Yeah, it's probably slower. So here, I think, feel this kind of regal and majestic feeling with a little bit slower tempo. And then go back to tempo. Yeah, something quite urgent. But, you know, the first time I heard this, probably I would predict this will push us to another climax. But it did not. Yeah, it, it, rises to a very high register. <laughs> it transits us to a totally chorale section. Yeah, this um, from measure 80 up on to uh, almost uh, 100. It's, it's a, a chorale writing. It's very calm, very Serene, uh, and of course, this is foreshadowing what comes before this, this uh, crazy coda. Yeah, this is of course more steel, all the whole notes, and here we have yeah, quite similar feeling. Yeah. When we sing in the choir, um, most of the time your voice doesn't move very much, right? Because if it moves up a seven, down a six, it's not really not good uh, counterpoint writing. But sometimes you have an interesting thing to show, please show them, not just the, the top melody. Left hand. You're inside your own world. The time has stopped. Yeah. So, so that feeling of urgency, right? That moving feeling is totally lost. Yeah. And here, do, 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 do. this middle voice, which is played by two hands, again another thing Bach does. Um. It's marked, the fingering that provided is one, 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 one. Everything is one. And of course, it's easier to play with two, one. Yeah. Um, but if we stick with one, 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 then we have the same tone. 
and it's a almost a horn like. <laughs> That's something Chopin does all the time. Yeah, there was this the round note etude in the middle, in that part. Uh, yeah, it's the same register and same same feeling. Um, and after this chorale section, Texture-wise, it's not as thick, right? It doesn't have so many layers, but then very interesting treatment of the of the rhythm. This almost like you're throwing something on the on the uh, air, in the air, and then you wait for it to drop. Yeah. So there is no strict counting here. Yeah. If you play. It's, it's super boring, it's not the right style. So you can speed up a little bit. And then we... Uh, wait for it to drop. Um, the other thing about this piece is, um, it's probably the most Bach-like. Yeah, as I mentioned, there's so many layers, so many voices. And then the character changes way often very frequently yeah so we had that chorale section and followed by that uh, kind of very majestic feeling and then we had this kind of playing with the rhythm and here we have a dance section uh, in measure 112 <laughs> not a three-part symphonia but the well and then yeah every voice has its own character every voice has its own contour the shape of the phrasing and we have to of course um, always bring them separately um, measure 125. Chopin put tenuto on the middle voice, and it's again that, that same register of this uh, brass or horn sound. these horns I and mean, when I think Chopin's favorite of course is the piano and then the next one is I assume it's cello right? he had friends who wrote a cello sonata uh, one of the few chamber works and the other one as a matter of fact is a piano trio which also involves a, uh, a cello um, and the other kind of romantic uh, instrument is the French horn so so I guess here that feeling uh, really reminiscence the, the horn play and this again we see uh, in measure 134 with an open bar there's no a measure line um, and it's small print um, and of course we talk about this a little bit in the etude series right it's not something yeah you play deep it's something you play you don't play it all the way to the bottom of the key, it's something lighter. And also the other aspect of this is the rhythm is also not Yeah, it's not strict uh, strict. It's something you speed up and then you slow down, speed up. Really this is like the summer breeze. Yeah, it comes and then goes. Um, I push it 
a little bit the tempo to the top. Yeah. Okay, so here is where I would stop. I've covered a lot of materials so far. Um, the next part, if I just play this measure, you would guess it's a Bach fugue, yeah, or at least it's some kind of a imitative thing. So again, this is homage to, to J.S. Bach. Well, thank you for your support. Um, hopefully, uh, I will make another episode uh, next week uh, and then continue with this piece. See you guys next week.